Looking to start a church, business, or nonprofit organization in 2021? Do you need help forming an LLC, applying for a copyright or trademark, revising church bylaws, crafting a succession plan, or developing a compensation package for your pastor and staff? Contact the law office of Travel Travis, a Richmond-based legal boutique focused on the needs of pastors, entrepreneurs, creatives, and our community. Let's make your vision a reality in 2021. Visit TravelTravis.com. That's T-R-A-V-E-L-L Travis. If you're concerned about the future of your organization when you step down, then where will the mantle fall? A biblical and legal guide to succession planning is a must read for you. It delves into the scriptural and legal aspect of succession planning, characteristics of successors, the people, the process, church bylaws, common myths, even issues with nepotism. Where will the mantle fall? Written by Rich Mazzone attorney, Pastor Travel Travis and available at Amazon.com. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Mantle Mondays. My name is Travell Travis, and it's an honor uh, to be your host on tonight. We want to invite you to like, to share, to tag, to comment, let somebody know uh, that Mantle Mondays is on. Thank God for all those who are saying praise the Lord and are representing. I see Praise Covenant and ICAF and, and friends and brothers from um, all over the country that are on uh, tonight. Um, as we interview entrepreneurs, authors, leaders, and pastors. And tonight we have someone that represents all four. He is an entrepreneur, uh, the owner of a, a restaurant and many other entrepreneurial endeavors. He's the author uh, of four books. Um, he is the pastor of two churches, one church in two locations in California and Kentucky. And he's the founder of a Reformation, the International Christian Apostolic uh, Fellowship. Uh, I think it was in 2016, he summons uh, the youth past, the youth leaders uh, from the different reformations to come to Indianapolis for the counterculture movement. I was just so honored to be included <laughs> in the group with so many great leaders from so many great apostolic organizations. And ever since then, um, he's been a, a father figure, a friend, a mentor, um, one of my heroes in the faith. And so it's a great honor to, to introduce to some and present to others, uh, Bishop Dr. William L. Harris IV. Let's receive him on tonight. Bless your heart. Bless <laughs> you. Good to be with you, Bishop Travis. God bless you, Bishop. How are you feeling? I'm fantastic and i um, happy to be here on your show tonight and pray God's blessings upon you. Now, where in the world are you right now? I am literally... Uh, in Louisville, Kentucky, as you know, the Derby was this weekend in Louisville, Kentucky. I'm not here for the Derby, <laughs> but uh, I was able to come to check on one of our churches here in the city. Okay, because I know anywhere, even during the pandemic, you've been traveling, traveling yes. throughout the country, uh, right. still doing your pastoral duties and presiding bishop duties. So I just thank God for you taking time out of your schedule tonight. Also, happy 50th birthday to you. <laughs> thank you. Um, I'm officially an old man now. I can get my AARP card. <laughs> I'm officially old, uh, 50. You know something amazing? A lot of people have seen me working so long, they thought I was a lot older. And so when I announced I turned 50, I had bishops, presiding bishops, call said, man, we never knew you were doing this work in your 30s and your 40s. And so uh, I guess I'm officially made it when I'm <laughs> I, I love that. I, I saw you celebrate. How did you celebrate your birthday? Uh, it was awesome. We, uh, of course, thought we were going to be having a virtual party and would just only be able to do it virtually. And uh, someone came up with a great idea that I would take some close friends and we were going to go to Vegas and we were going to go to Vegas 
and uh, celebrate. So we did have a virtual party, but we had a, a few of our close friends there with us. Just a, a time to relax uh, and to enjoy and celebrate. And then we also did the virtual party for those in our organization, our churches, so they could connect. But it was a fun time with our family and friends there in Vegas. You mean Pentecost, the preachers can go to Vegas? Yes. You know, it's amazing. The Sin City. I, I am uh, the presiding bishop in Sin City uh, <laughs> celebrating uh, my party. So we kept it safe and, uh, and, and safe. Let's do safe <laughs> and safe is what we did. But we had a good time. We had a good time. I love that. I love that. You mentioned earlier about some of the other presiding bishops thinking that you were older because of the things that you've accomplished. You're, you're a pastor, you're a founding presiding bishop, not just a presider, the founder of a reformation, author, entrepreneur, one of the youngest, the youngest uh, consecrated bishop in, I guess you say in the apostolic movement, Pentecostal movement, yes. all by age 50. What else do you want to accomplish? You know, uh, you know I thought about that. And when you turn 50, you actually stop and think about the past, and then you start thinking about the future. I thought about my past, and I, I did recognize that uh, the Lord had really graced me to do a lot um, uh, at an early age. I was actually saved at four years old. A part of the testimony, many people don't know, I really was baptized in Jesus' name, received the Holy Ghost literally at four. Uh, and uh, the older saints testify about how I used to stand on the front bench, and I would testify at four and shout at four years old. And the testimony that many don't know is the Lord blessed me to stay saved, you know, all through those ages and then graduate from high school saved. I went to graduate school, undergraduate school, all of this being saved and uh, in the church. And so when I when I came of age to preach, I started preaching at 17, 18 okay. and uh, went to Enon Bible College um, through the period of my dad was independent. And that's when I met Bishop Tyson and Bishop Golder and Wagner. And they mentored me. And uh Never forget the three o'clock nights uh, in the chapel at Enon. And really in the morning, sometimes 12 midnight, uh, I would have Bishop Tyson saying, preach at the chapel. Nobody was in the room but me, him, and Bishop Golder. And I would have a chance to preach in front of them. Quit moving your hands. And and they would mentor me all these times. I was a student body president, so we would work together. And, and basically that developed into ministry, uh, preaching around the country. And they opened a lot of doors for me. Uh, and the, the accomplishments came through just being humble to God's call. Okay. Never dreamed of it, never planned most of the stuff that happened. And um, starting at a young age, it became just something to me was normal. I didn't even know I was making great achievements. I was just <laughs> basically, you know, we came up under time where you just had to serve. And, you know, right. they didn't give you that. You worked for it. And uh, when I got 50, it was before then that I saw the hand of God in my life. But at 50, I really looked back and said, man. And one of the older presiders called me and said, Bishop Harris, by being 50, you've accomplished more than some of us that have been around here for a long time and old enough to be your grandfather. So it's God's grace. Um, and I looked forward from that point and said, hey, to answer your question, you know, what do I want to achieve? I am young to think about legacy, but I'm <laughs> actually thinking about legacy. I'm thinking about succession. I'm thinking okay. about. What do I want to do? And so this part of my life, I'm building people. You know, I built platforms the first 50 years. My vision now is to build people. And I am now surrounding myself with sons and daughters, those in the ministry that I'm mentoring. I, I mentor a lot of pastors and really just depositing what I've learned. I don't know it all, but that that I've learned, I'm trying to give to others so that whatever I have been able to build, it will have succession and it will continue. I love that. The fact that you're already thinking about how to give back and empower the next generation, the fact that you received the Holy Ghost at four. I've heard of seven. I've heard of 10. I've never heard of four. You're, you're, in, you're in daycare. <laughs> you got the Holy Ghost. You're, you're preaching in daycare. And, and how God kept you. And, and sometimes people feel like you, you have to go out in the world and you have to experience that. But seeing how you stayed in the house of God and how God has accelerated you and prospered you, let you know that there's blessings in staying in the house, serving Thank God, you. honoring uh, those fathers. What do you think? Now you're you know, you're not the only student there. Why do you think they took to you and, and just said, "We're gonna pull you aside. We're gonna pour everything we got into you." Well, you know, I actually at that point wasn't the oldest. I was actually the youngest, okay. and it seems like Bishop Travis, everything I've done, 
I was always the youngest. <laughs> you know, uh, even according to the PW records, I think I'm like the youngest elder okay. that was even ever ordained. And I, I have a good story for that. Uh, but I think it was my youth, and they made me all of that. At that time, you know, I was a, a, a school for people that were older. People okay. would leave their jobs and you know, after vocation, they would come to Enon and I was there full time. So by being the youngest kid, they all elected me student body president. Okay. So because when I became student body president, uh, Dr. Betty Showell Tyson was the wife of the late Bishop Tyson at that time. She was the president okay. of, of Enon. And so I had to work with her and just work with her uh, caused me to be around the school a lot working around the school at all. And I think that they saw my passion and they saw a 17, 18 year old boy sitting in the back of the class with all of these bishops. At that point, you had actually bishops from Indianapolis okay. was in my class. And um, I was sitting in the back corner and I, I was graced to be that age with all these older men. And I think the pastors and the bishops and all of my teachers, they took to that and um, they took to me and I didn't know them. I was from a small independent storefront right. church. Nobody knew me. Okay. I had no name. I, I wasn't a bishop's son. My dad wasn't a bishop at that time. Okay. Just a young man, loved God, been in church all of my life and wanted to be a preacher. That's all I wanted. To, I always wanted to preach the gospel. And I think they saw that passion and they picked on me. Uh, and it wasn't always good. I mean, a lot of correction I got. <laughs> and they were old school at that point. Oh, they, yeah. they didn't cold no punches. If you didn't do it right, they tell you. But for me, I didn't even always understand it then. Okay. But later I got in ministry, man, I think that was a Harvard education. I, I look back now and think about uh, the, the privilege I had to sit at their feet and to learn from some of the greatest of all time. And I believe that and I contribute that a lot of my blessings came from me being able to serve and hearing and being taught by some of the greatest pastors of all time. Wow. Do you think young men are willing to endure what you endured today, that type of harsh mentoring to make you better? Uh, to say the least, not many. You know, okay. I never forget when I became uh, called to pastor, I went to my own father and said, listen, I feel like I'm called to preach. And he made me wait three years and um, didn't even flinch. You know, um, <laughs> now people are, you know, if you don't do what they request, they're leaving your church. And because there's always somebody else that will, prophesy something different right. and right. Uh, then you have that's what they call church hurt now a lot of the things that we used to call church hurt now okay. was just discipline in our day you know now that's they it. say if, if the pastor don't agree with me he's holding back my gift and then they tell us go clean the bathroom you call to preach right go serve go vacuum and so they will call that church abuse in our today in our day <laughs> in our society but for us it was just, it was mentorship and we enjoyed it. We didn't always understand it, right. but we submitted ourselves. And I believe it built a different type of preacher uh, today than we are used to seeing. But under your breath, what are times like, man, I wish they would leave me alone. I wish oh they would get off me. <laughs> when I have a story for my father, uh, my mother shares that before that um, I was waiting and I was waiting. And I, I called myself, I'm going to really be bold. And I prayed, I'm going to go and tell it. And I went to his office and I said, hey, you're standing in the way of God. Now, to say that in that time, that was almost like, you know, <laughs> Elijah standing up to the false prophets. You know, you you go, fire going to fall. So uh, he looked at me and he said, all right, go on back in there and clean up the church again. You know, it, he didn't even, <laughs> it, it didn't even move him, right? Uh, eventually, it was only a short time after that, though, that he came back to me and told me at the time I said that is the time God answered the call and told him uh, it's time. It was time. But at the same time, it was many times I was like, man, man, I'm being held back. And I was always talented to preach. So I was watching other people in the pulpit. He was letting other people preach in front of me. And I was like, hey, I can do that. You know how young preachers you get in your mind. He right. using these people. Why did he not use me? But now, because I pastor pastors and the position I'm in, all of that was a crash course for God training me on how to deal with people in this season. And I, I really appreciate my father, Bishop Whitmer Sr., all of the other bishops that poured into me because it made me who I am today. There was a question that appeared on the screen for maybe a teenager, or a young person who's who has a call in their life, saved at an early age. Any tips for staying saved? Did, did, did you want to be kept or did God keep you at times even when you didn't want to be kept? 
Oh, I, I, you know, I'm very transparent. And um, one of the greatest testimonies I believe that I should share tonight, I don't think I've ever shared this on the live pr platform, was that I was a virgin when I got married as well. And uh, my wife was a virgin. And uh, it's a testimony that most people hide from. I'm not ashamed of that. Uh, and I didn't want to be kept, honestly. You know, I was uh, one of those guys. I was always well educated. And I never forget uh, when I moved out, I had a penthouse on the 25th floor uh, of the Winter House Apartments in Indianapolis. I had a brand new Mercedes 380 SEL with 20 inch rims. I was doing this. So y'all know at 20, I was like, I worked at Eli Lilly Pharmaceutical Company. I made good money. I thought I was cute. You know how we do coming up. Right. And my dad at that point was a bishop and I'm, I'm living life. And I had so many temptations and sexually, right. uh, sinfully. And I, I call myself backsliding, literally. I didn't go to church for six months. And I told my mother, I said, I don't know if I really want to do this. And I never forget this, how the temptations came. And that was the season I don't think I wanted to be kept. Okay. But the Lord kept me. And um, I look back at it now and the testimonies I give to my children and young people uh, that whatever you want to do, uh, if you have a made up mind, God, God will keep you. And that sounds old school, mm -hmm. but he'll keep those that want to be kept. And so I do believe there was times that I didn't want to be saved, but I didn't really recognize what that was. And I think it's because I grew up in church all of my life. Okay. Uh, sometimes you have this little curiosity. Mm -hmm. uh, you know what the other side of the world is about. Uh, right. But now that I look back at all my friends that backslid or didn't get saved and I see their lives now, I'm very appreciative of the Holiness Foundation, the foundation of faith and the, the fact that the Lord kept me at a very, very young age. And I attribute my successes to the fact that I didn't get caught up in a lot of stuff. Right that a lot of other men got caught up in. And so we can say through testimony that the Lord is a keeper. Thank you, Jesus. Thank Hallelujah. you, Hallelujah. That's right. So uh, baptized, filled with the Holy Ghost at four, start preaching at 17. You become a bishop in your 20s. How does that happen? You know, it, most of the reformations, if you're lucky, maybe late 30. <laughs> maybe late 30. I was the youngest in way of the cross. I was 39. Right. That was the youngest ever way of the cross. How did you become a bishop in your 20s? Man, I I was favored uh, all my life, but I was in the uh, AAFC at that point, the Bishop Jim Boone, which okay. I love so dearly. And the Lord gave me grace to serve um, at the conventions uh, as his armor bearer. Everywhere I went, everybody that knows me knew I served. I was the guy that uh, always had the briefcase and a lot of things I learned about being a presider because I was in the room. I tell my son, stay in the picture, stay in the room. Mm -hmm. So I was in bishop board rooms at 16, 17, 18, but I was serving. I was carrying people's briefcases. Uh, bishop Boone allowed me to serve him as a home member. They gave me access to training. Um, I became uh, active in the organization in a lot of roles, the international youth president, uh, began to move up in the organization. Uh, I became a uh, part of uh, a new team there uh, that was the vision keepers and uh, was helping form secessional plans, as you're talking about tonight, okay. uh, helping get the organization ready for secession, which let me get uh, in, activated uh, to the bishop board and uh, begin to connect with all the bishops. And the transition happened in the organization in California. Of all the okay. places that I am now, nobody knew I would be there. Uh, and a transition happened and uh, the presider asked me, you know, uh, would this be something that I would even consider? And I was young at that point, of course. Uh, and I said, yes. And um, it was only a year or so after that, uh, that uh, in Chicago, I think it was in Chicago, uh, that I was ordained as the diocesan bishop over California. Bishop Boone, at that point, maybe he did see it. But I was not even interested in pastoring in California at that point. <laughs> and, uh, he put me over a region that I'm now pastoring in, I mean, years later. And so uh, I was a young man. Um, I never forget that convention, me and my wife um, sitting on the front row. And I got ordained. And uh, uh, historically, at that particular point, uh, I became the youngest ever ordained diocesan bishop in the world. Uh, and that was from a Pentecostal perspective and also non-Pentecostal perspectives at that time. It may have changed right. uh, from that time now, 
Um, but um, that's what happened. And it wasn't something I looked for. We didn't, you know, politic for. I never thought that that would even occur in my lifetime. I'm like you. I came up where uh, you almost had to be 60. Uh, <laughs> and then somebody had to die. Right. Uh, for you to even even be considered. And so it was a shock to me and I think everybody around us, but the whole bishop board voted, I do a dual consent, that I would become the diocesan bishop with no opposition at that point. And they trusted me. And uh, we served there and began to build the state. I, I, I'm just blown blown away by that because you, you hear it today and you probably experienced this as a presider, you know, how many people lobby to become a yeah. bishop? How many people threaten to leave? <laughs> if they don't become a bishop and it's almost we've given out that that title almost as a pacifier yes. to, to either recruit people to our reformations or to keep yeah. people in our reformations and here it is as a young man um they bestow this title on you hey, were you already a pastor i was pastoring uh, at that time so i had started pastoring i want to pick up on something you just said and i think it's so important that we have so overpopulized the position of a bishop that now it almost means nothing to a lot of people because you can go online now and make yourself a bishop. You have people <laughs> making themselves bishops. You have right. deacons of a church making the pastor a bishop. I mean, right. I had a picture the other day. A man was laying hands on himself, uh, <laughs> making him uh, you know, a bishop. And so in our society, when I came up a bishop, uh, you respected that. It, you you had so much reverence for people. You knew they earned it. You know, or there was an anointing right. upon their life that caused somebody to bestow that honor. And now, you know, people become bishops um, through politics or mm -hmm. that they leave because and then they go start their own reformations because they're mad at another reformation, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, the motives behind the, some of our elevations are not pure. And I believe that that has really affected uh, the culture in the church, the order in the church, and even, and this may sound uh, different, but the power in the church, because I believe that the church is somewhat out of alignment. And a part of uh, some of us that are younger pastors and bishops, we have a responsibility, not just to preach for a shout, not just to teach for a crowd, but somebody has to bring alignment to the church. So this next generation can flow into the anointings and the glory that I believe God has for this last day church. So Bishop Boone, and for those who are watching uh, that, that follow YLC, Young Leaders Conference, Elder Mark Moore, Bishop Moon, Bishop Boone is Elder Moore's grandfather on his through his mother. So, so that makes a connection for some that may be uh, watching. When he made that decision and he went to the Board of Bishops, were they basing that on, I know you had served, but were they also looking at potential, they, the, the hand of God? What was their calculus or calcul uh, thought process to say, he's the man right now, not 10 right. years, not 20 years right. to put in this position? You know, the Bible says that a man gifts makes room for him and brings him before great people. And I share with my sons and daughters, you should be doing the work of something before somebody uh, appoint you to it. So in my church, if a man is going to be called or appointed to be an elder, mm -hmm. we don't appoint you and you start working. You right. have to be working as an elder to get the appointment. I was really, my path is different. I was already serving with the bishop board. And it was okay. an amazing thing where because of a committee, Bishop Boone had put me over the vision keepers, which was a successional pl uh, plan. Okay. It was okay. a, a group he entrusted me with the bylaws. We were rewriting the church, the organization bylaws. I was responsible for coming up with structure. There's another bishop named Bishop Joel Trout. I don't know if you know him, but Bishop yeah. Joel Trout and I was working together at one point. And uh, the whole thing was restructuring. And so I was brought into that position, but I was already literally in the board meeting. I was okay. had a seat at the table. Okay. And so when the thought from Bishop Boone came, I was already doing work gotcha. and they had trust in me. So it wasn't because of the position that they gave me. It was because of the work that I was already doing. And when it came up on the board, uh, I never forget that. Um, it was already, I can see in the bishop's eyes and I had to go talk to some of them because I didn't really accept it right away. Right, right. And I said, do you all think that I should do this? How would it affect my future? And I'm so young and I came from old school that I'm not supposed to be here yet. Right. I was willing to, to not receive it and just continue to work. And uh, one of the bishops, I won't call his name, he's still living. He came to me 
Uh, and he said, listen, take advantage of the seat that you have at the table. He said, you already got the seat. Right. He said, uh, we're giving you favor. And they were in that time. You have to see this. Most of the bishops there were 60, probably 70 plus. Right. I don't know if we had any bishops under 70. Right. And if you see me as a young man, late 20s, sitting at a bishop board, it looked like <laughs> something anyway. I felt indifferent about it. Um, but they they gave it to me based upon the work that I was already doing, not the work that they thought I would do. But I can't say that they didn't see okay. in my future uh, something that I couldn't see. And sometimes your fathers can see in you right. things that you cannot see in yourself. So how did the churches under your diocese, were they, were they as quick to receive you? Well, I'll be honest with you, and uh, we laugh about this sometimes. They gave me a diocese that was not yet organized. <laughs> and so now that I look back at it, I said, well, maybe they gave it to the young man because the old man said, I'm not going to California and build. Bishop okay. Boone knew I was a builder. And I've always been, I have a unique ability to start churches and to build. And that's one thing that I've been graced with. And so I basically went to California with nothing, basically. I think it was one church, maybe in one church. If my And I went with one church. And the, the whole goal was, can you go build a diocese? Gotcha. And will you travel? And a lot of the older bishops probably was like, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> and, uh, and so I had the ability to do it at that point. And, uh, and so I think that the church that was there did receive me. And um, over that year, we were able to build a very strong diocese and, and it was just growing and growing and it was blessed. And it was also a key to how I ended up moving to California okay. uh, and even starting uh, my ministry. So I know the hand of the Lord, the hand of the Lord. Now we can look sometime in retrospect and see God at that moment. I didn't know what God was doing, <laughs> honestly. but now in retrospect, I can look back and I've always honored Bishop Boone for right. being one of my greatest spiritual fathers. I spent more time with him probably than Bishop Tyson Okay. and or Bishop Golder or Bishop Wagner. And I think that he really poured into me a lot. And I learned, if you knew Bishop Boone, you have to know, he was one of the sharpest older men that you could probably ever meet. And I sat at the table and watched him handle crisis. I watched how he brought people together that other bishops couldn't bring together. I saw I saw, I saw, saw the good, the bad, and the ugly. And wow. But how he dealt with it made me a better man. And I appreciate you saying this because... You know, my consecration was four years ago, and I still wrestle with it. I still feel that I shouldn't be in a position. But, mm -hmm. you know, the, 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 the vote went down, and they said, no, yeah. oh, this is your time. But I, I wrestle with it then. I still wrestle with it now. So I, I appreciate you you saying that. Now, I want I want to shift the question. You, you talked about the, the organization trying to put together – succession planning. Uh, I'm not sure how your organization is structured, but I know a lot of ours, we're, we're a fellowship of independent churches. It's not that we own the church. Mm -hmm. It's not that the organization has with so much control over the church. So when that pastor passes on, we try to help, but at the same time, legally, it, 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 we really don't have a so much say. What did you try to establish um, in, in that organization in terms of succession planning? Well, uh, you know, I've, um, in, in keeping with our current structure of, of conversation, becoming a presiding bishop and a founding presiding bishop mm -hmm. means that the majority of my bishops are older. I have right. people in my organization that are three times my age almost. Well, I should say <laughs> when I started. Uh, when I started uh, the organization, uh, when I say that, I mean, I have some bishops in their 80s, right? Um, some older men. Um, and when I started the organization, one thing that I learned, and I, I did this not from just my organization, but again, by being in former organizations, I had a chance to see bishops not playing correctly. Mm -hmm. I was behind the scenes. I've been at funerals where I had to raise offerings at the funeral. Right. Um, right. I've seen first ladies behind the scenes come to me and was like, hey, we don't have money. Can you help us raise money? I've seen churches, uh, the vision hijacked, where churches had 3,000 members, choose the wrong secession plan, and now they have 30. I've seen it all. And I've, some of these churches, I've been a part of the, the transitions. Right. And so I've seen the good. I've seen people transition right. I've seen them do it bad. And so when I became presider, one of the good things that happened for a young man like me, I'm more mobile. Okay. I don't have a lot of red tape. I don't have 100 years of history. I don't have to go through 
all these mm-hmm. votes. And so I had a, the ability to set some structure okay. that maybe or, other organizations didn't have a chance to do originally. And okay. so in our organization, I really uh, require all of our pastors to really write out a plan of action. Okay. Uh, to me, that is very, very important. And I always secondly have them identify who it is that they would want to transition to okay. and uh, try publicly uh, to let the people know in the congregation as well who it is. And then I also have them really inform me of who it is, uh, okay. because some pastors have a secret plan. But when it stays secret and it's not written down and nobody mm-hmm. knows it, it can be hijacked because if you die and right. you never shared what your vision for transition would be, and then the presiding bishop, like in my case, right, uh, we don't have the authority to go in legally and put somebody right. in. We have to almost deal with whoever you lead, whether they're the right <laughs> person or, or the wrong person. And so I still don't have the authority to legally do it. Okay. But I really, really try to challenge our pastors to talk about it. And then I bring people in all the time. We have a lot of, our organization is more educational than okay. inspirational. So right. we do a lot of training. I try to bring a lot of people in to share with them on methods and ways to do it. But I right. believe that it's just really been intentional. I always believe success is not by accident, but right. success is intentional. And wow. so I tell them in order for them to be successful, they're going to have to be intentional about their transition. So what do you say to a pastor who says, I'm afraid to make an announcement or a proclamation because I don't know how certain people will receive it, or they've seen situations where a successor was named in the church split immediately. What do you say mm-hmm. to that person who's afraid to go on the record, this is who I want? Well, I, I think that you don't always have to announce it. Uh, okay. I think you go back old school, like some of the older pastors did. They would put the person in a position to do the work. Okay. And I think a person's gift will make room for them. So I advise pastors, you don't have to always uh, officially announce the successor, mm-hmm. but give your successor, successor the opportunity to gain uh, the, the authority and favor from the people. You know, I always tell people there's two different types of authority. You have formal authority and you have earned authority. Mm-hmm. Formal authority is what you give a person through a title or an announcement. Earned respect and authority is when you give a person a chance to work okay. and that will earn the respect of the people. So I always challenge pastors, put people in place in some kind of role mm-hmm. that can go earn the authority. Because if you die, you would rather have that person have earned authority than formal authority anyway. Because if they've seen them work, if they know your heart, if you let them prove that they have your spirit and and God's anointing and grace is upon them, it makes it easier for the people mm-hmm. to make a transition and the church and organizational leadership to make the transition with a person that we've all seen right. in the role. They may not have had it formally, right. but in some way you, you, you can talk without announcing. You can speak <laughs> right. without writing it out on a certificate. And I think pastors, if they would use that wisdom to at least while you're living, because I believe transition should be in life and not death. And so while you're living, if possible, share the stage, share your grace, Mm -hmm. share the time with not maybe one person, but those that you feel God has sent to you. I love that. I love that. So so what would happen if you given the platform, you given them the stage and people kind of back in the mind said, okay, maybe they're trying to position them and it just ain't working. Like right. they're just not the one that they don't have to get. What do you do then? I think that a pastor um, specifically, again, we're talking about transition in life, which it mm-hmm. gives you options. Mm-hmm. You know, when you transition in death and you put the only, the, ro- the wrong one up there, you have no chance to fix it. We can't make an adjustment. Right. But if you're living in life, I, you can make an adjustment. I remember a pastor who put somebody up and that person actually left the church. Okay. And and, and so, of course, that's going to cause uh, an issue uh, as far as his secessional plan. But as I told him, you still have a chance to make the adjustment. Right. And some right. pastors actually believe that somebody is the right person. But until, uh, you know, this is a statement and I don't know how this sets well with the audience, but Mike Tyson is not a person I quote from much. <laughs> but Mike Tyson said, everybody has a plan until they get hit. And he was right. talking about like when he was fighting 
Everybody okay. could beat Mike Tyson until they got in the ring. He said, everybody knew how to beat me or, or defeat me until I hit him in the face. And so I say that with people. Everybody even thinks they can be a pastor until mm -hmm. they have to face certain things. And they will find out pastoring is not about how good you can preach. Right. Pastoring is about how much you can endure. And, and what type of grace is upon your life. And I think that even a senior pastors may have a good preacher or a person they think is the right one. You really don't know that until you put them in the ring. Right. And, and we got to let them get hit. And once they get hit, you may even make an adjustment and say, I thought, <laughs> I thought they were the right. one. But if you do it in life and you give an right. opportunity for growth, right. you can either make an adjustment and teach them to take right. the hit next time. Right. Or if they're not the right person, you have a, an opportunity to make an adjustment. Do you think it's possible for a mantle to be intercepted or hijacked or can someone produce a counterfeit mantle? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I actually would be honest with you. People are hijacking a lot of mantles all over. You know, I travel internationally. And one thing that I can say you get a lot of people drop a lot of names, you know, and, and our, our generation is about, you know, not really the oil that God has given, mm -hmm. but it's about the politics or connections that we can we right. can manufacture. Right. And so uh, a lot of people and I've been careful with this because I've had many pastors come to my churches mm -hmm. and a lot of people come for your platform. Right. They don't have good intentions for your ministry. They don't have good intentions for your future, your legacy or secession. Some people are just hurt at a season. Mm -hmm. uh, they come and they want a place to come. And if you're not careful and you don't discern the intentions of the people coming, it's very easy to pick a talented person, but not an anointed person. Wow. It's, wow. it's very easy to pick a person that can preach the roof off, but character is right. not right. Right. Uh, it's very easy to have a gifted person that can lay hands on the sick and have charisma. Mm -hmm. but don't like people. Right. And a pastor without discernment will choose the talent over the anointing. Mm -hmm. wow. And uh, what will happen is you'll put somebody in position that can preach, but right. can't pastor. Right. They can sing, but they don't have grace to mm -hmm. take care of the people. And, and so it's very, it's, we have to be very careful through discernment that we don't let people hijack our secessional plan, hijack you know, our secession. And it happens all the time where a pastor picks somebody because they can draw people. They pick right. people because they can. And, and, you know, we do that a lot with conferences, too. Right. Uh, you know, we, we we also I sometimes I look on Facebook and the same preachers are preaching That's at every it. conference. That's it. And we're not really choosing speakers now because of how they can impart to people. Mm -hmm. We choose for the praise break. Right. But what right. people don't understand when the praise break is over, my God, these people are going to have to have something to live with. And a pastor is not like an evangelist. We can't shout people all the time. There you We're go. gonna have to sometimes correct. Mm -hmm. You got a discipline. Mm -hmm. You they're gonna talk about you, and you can't talk back. Right. You are gonna endure things that other men cannot endure. And if you came as a fly by night charismatic preacher, right, and you don't really care for the people, right. uh, if I would choose somebody like that to secede me, my whole ministry probably wouldn't last wow. uh, ten years after I die because I chose someone charismatic that hijacked my ministry, uh, but wasn't the son. I believe everyone, every pastor, whether male or female, when they're choosing a successor, it should be somebody that's a son of your ministry, somebody that has sat with okay. you, that understand your vision. They may not be the best preacher in the group. They may not okay. be the most charismatic person. They may not uh, are known all over the world, but they're going to keep what God has entrusted to you continuing even in mm -hmm. the years after your death. So a son, so you wouldn't recommend someone from the outside coming in? I would if that person has been connected to your ministry or understand okay. your vision. I think one of the mistakes that have been made is, again, we pick people for notoriety and popularity. And right. in many places, it depends upon the structure of your church. Right. If you have a charismatic church that's mm -hmm. built upon reputation only, Right. A person with good reputation can come in and could grow that ministry. Right. But it depends upon the pastor's vision of what they're trying to build. And again, what they want their legacy to be. So sometimes uh, outside person, if you don't have somebody internally, could come in. But even in that person, 
I think the pastor, if he picks a person that's not connected to ministry, right. that person needs to sit at the foot of that pastor. The feet of the pastor. connection there. And they got to build that connection. They got to understand the history. I've seen it negative. I've seen right. outside people come in and put the first lady out of the pastor that brought him in. Oh my goodness. I've seen outside people come in and disrespect the total legacy of a church. Right. And they played like with the man when he was living, I got you. Right. And not two months after they died, they are changing everything that that pastor has created. So I've seen good situations where it actually worked. But in most of my 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 study, uh, I've seen the most successful transitions were men or women that was at least connected to that pastor. It okay. could be through organization. Right. It could be through fellowship. Sometimes it could have been through he wasn't a son, but they were connected in the spirit. They were friends right. or they shared vision. Okay. And when it came together, it worked out for the good. I, li I like that. That expanded understanding of what, what in-house is, not just yeah. the, the associate minister, but right. still, still a connection there. There's a sonship. There's a right a bond there because I've seen from the opposite end where you forced someone in-house. Yes, yes. And, and none of them were qualified. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> so, so one of the things I love about your reformation is the impartation. You, you, you shared that uh, ICAF got started really about teaching and, mm -hmm. and, and training. A lot of organizations, you know, you don't hear from the bishop until it's time for credential fees, annual report, or dues. <laughs> but one of the things I see you doing all the time mm -hmm. is, is imparting and training. Why is that important in, in today? Why is that important? Um, I'm going I'm to shift back to come forward. Okay. And I'll shift back to the beginning of ICAF was not an organization as a fellowship. Okay. And I did, and many people don't know this, almost 10 years of think tanks okay. with some of the greatest presiding bishops of all time. Um, I think almost every presiding bishop of most reformations came through those think tanks. And what I did instead of starting an organization because I wanted to be a bishop, I went and studied what worked and what didn't work. Okay. And these were not published meetings. I mean, we would be in uh, back rooms with all of these presiders around the table, and I would be the moderator. Okay. And if you see the videos, man, I look like I was 20, right? <laughs> and uh, I would ask questions about what worked in your reformations. Okay. How did we split? There's a lot of apostolic history that I read that doesn't align with what the father said. Okay. And um, I would ask him, and this is what they told me. And a lot of things I do in my reformation is not really original to me. I always try to give credit to the people that imparted. It's the fathers that spoke this into my life. And the things that they talk about was similar to what you said. In many reformations, it became about money. Right. First thing I did with ICAF, I didn't want it to be about money. Mm -hmm. So all of our payments are the same no matter what size the church is. Okay. Number two is about relationships. They never heard from their presiders. Sometimes right. they, didn't, they didn't hear from their diocese. Right. And sometimes they didn't hear from their district elder. <laughs> unless they got at least 250 members. Right. And so the smaller churches mm -hmm. that couldn't afford the big tithing, that could not, didn't have members that nobody wanted to come and preach for them. Uh, they always felt left out. Okay. And Bishop Boone taught me that. Everybody got to be somebody. Okay. And uh, I learned from every bishop something important. Bishop Boone taught me that even the small church is important. Right. And we took the time to build those relationships. And then the third thing they talked to me about was training. Okay. That most organizations uh, did not provide. There was no benefits. Right. To being a part. So you pay registration and dues. Right. But what we would all ask is, what did we get from it? Right. Other than coming home broke from the convention. Right. <laughs> and, and so what I tried to do uh, in my reformation is to underline more training. So most pastors that join my reformation, they join because they say we get more in one conference. Right. Then sometimes we got in 10 years of going to our community. <laughs> now we shout, if you watch our, yeah. we shout, we yes, bring sir. artists in. I love great preaching. I love hooping. We do all that. But we spend a lot of time on really training pastors on the how to's of ministry. You know, what do you do? If you got 50 members, right. uh, you're still as important as a church with 500. And if I don't pour into you, you'll never get 500. Right. And right. so the Bible says we are destroyed because of our lack of knowledge. And so I believe what we do uh, that may be just a little different. I don't think we're the only ones that do it, but we're just a little different. We spend a lot of time in sessions that may not be so inspirational. 
that we right. actually educate them, train them, so that when they go home, they have something they can use okay. to go grow their ministries and grow their church. Because I feel like this, a growing organization's got to have growing churches. There you go. Right? And if my <laughs> churches are dying, then my organization is dying. So right. some bishops are afraid to give out the secrets because right. they want to have the biggest church in the organization. But the truth is, wow. you've got to learn to empower the people so that your move, it's like a pastor in the church, a strong families build strong churches. If right. you have weak families, your church is going to die. So I've always had the, the, the theory or theology that if you give back to people, you will eventually receive the investment from the deposits that you've given. Can these organizations shift that mentality or is it too embedded or ingrained? It, it, it just how it is, you can't change it. Well, here it is. I don't want to so get you in trouble, to, Bishop. <laughs> yeah, no, I understand. You know, I'll say it. Uh, so go to people, uh, leaders, so go to people. Okay. So here's here's the thought. Yes, it can be shifted, but we got to give up some of our preaching time. You know, yes, okay. it can be shifted, but we got to give up some of those two-hour offering times. Okay. Uh, yes, it can be shifted, but we're going to have to change the, you know, I wrote a book called Leadership. Yes, sir. And basically that book, there you go, right? Leadership. That book um, really talks about it takes a new kind of leader for the generation we're about to pasture. Okay. And so uh, if you're going to pastor lead in this generation, you're going to have to shift your leadership thoughts and shift your leadership principles so that you can become a leader, not of yesterday. Right. We need leaders of like today, right. like right now. And if we can do that, we can change this. And I think uh, yourself being a young bishop in your organization and uh, other young leaders around the country are coming up with innovative ideas. Mm -hmm. And if the platform is working, it has to start with training. It has to start with setting our generation down and saying, shouting is great. <laughs> but you need some money when you go home right. unless your shout is going to be a shout of frustration because you can't pay your bills. I want you to shout because you got the victory. <laughs> I want you to shout <laughs> because your bills are paid. I want you to shout because right. Right. God has favored you and God has blessed you. I think a lot of our shouting and crying is out of frustration, not because of blessings. Lord and you. so I really have a passion to tell leaders now Let's praise God. Let's shake the neighbor's hand. Right. Let, let's go touch the clock and run down and jump back over the pew. But let's also give the people something right. uh, to have when, when they go home. Let's right. make sure the preacher's not the only one with a nice car. And the right. preacher's not the only one with a nice house. And, and the bishop is not the only one that can afford a suite at the convention. Right. Let's make sure that we give back to others so that our people can be blessed. I really have a passion to shift the mindset of not just leadership, but the people, but it starts with leadership. So I started ICAP because, and this is gonna sound kind of selfish. This is my only selfish statement. I didn't feel like I had the strength mm -hmm. to go really fight with all the older bishops okay, and go through the red tape to try to make a transition happen. Right. And so I said, I'll take the hits. I'll, I'll be young and start a reformation right. to at least model some things. I may not be able to reach the world, but at least I can model to some other people the positive way to do something and be successful. Wow. 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 Let me let me pull up your books. I have Leadership. This is the, uh, well, I don't know if I'm doing them in order. Which one was That's first? Kingdom Come? Kingdom Come was first. All right. So I have Kingdom Come. Right. Then we have Leadership leadership right and then we have disturbed into my destiny. Destiny. that's the most recent now there's right. a book that i don't have that that's was it. the prepared preacher the book. yes i am actually rewriting that book okay and uh just to share with you a, a small insert the polished preacher is the name of it and what it is is a, it's a homiletics book it okay. is the art and science of preaching and it's, it goes back to what we're saying now. My passion was to train preachers because most of us learn to preach by watching people. Right. And most of us didn't have a chance to get a, a, a Harvard education or go to theological right. school to right. learn how to outline sermons and how to prepare and to deliver. And I had that opportunity to preach young in front of major crowds. And I, I had a chance to learn from, from Bishop Morris Golder, which was right. my homiletical instructor, Bishop James E. Tyson and Bishop Norman Wagner, everybody won't get the chance. And so what I tried to do is take 
uh, that information, put it in a book. Now I'm updating it now because I'm adding protocol to it. And uh, okay. I'm, I'm teaching people how to do organizational protocol, church protocol, weddings, funerals, speaking at academic events, because I think the younger generation needs to not just be anointed, but polished. I hope that makes right. sense. Not just uh, can holler in the mic. Some people think the louder you holler, the more anointed you are. So I'm trying to teach them. It's not about how loud you holler, but it's about how you present the information, especially to this new generation. It has to be in a more educated way right? so that they can understand it and they can consume what we have to say. So for the pastors in your reformation and others that you're connected to, what is this pandemic meant to them? How are you helping them navigate it? What what are the best practices that we're, you're you're deriving? What do you say to a pastor that feel like they're losing everything that they they worked to build? How how are you helping pastors during this pandemic? Well, I have done, uh, and I believe you were actually literally on one of our panels uh, for our organization. I have done uh, quite a bit of. Um, planning and presenting to leaders of our organization on how to navigate COVID. And I believe education is the tool for a lot of things that we need. Um, you know, this is what we call this new normal. You know, it, it, right. it caused pastors to have to emerge from where we are. And I'm a little different with my perspective. I believe that God allowed this to happen for several reasons. One is to get the church out of his comfort zone. Right. Right. And so in some ways, you know, everybody said that COVID was a curse, but mm -hmm. in many ways, COVID was a blessing as well because it made the church get out of its four walls. Right. And it made us become more relevant to the times and seasons. Right. And so churches had to move into this digital world. Right. They had to move outside of their four walls. Pastoring now has to be more intellectual mm -hmm. uh, than it was in touching. Right. Uh, and so we had to, as pastors, we had to refine our preaching. Right. Uh, we had to quit being so emotional because he was preaching in the church with nobody. Right. And I remember for months I'm preaching to a little red light and a camera. <laughs> with no amens, but maybe my wife and the sound man, you know. Right. And so we wasn't getting to turn to no neighbors. So you right. you couldn't say too many hallelujahs and thank right. you, Jesus. Turn to your neighbor. You couldn't use the antics. You right. you had to have a word. You had right. to now figure this out. How can I get what God has given me to the people without any ceremonialism, right. without without any music in certain ways, mm -hmm. without without any singing, I had to find a way. And I believe it's refined the church. I love it, honestly. It, it happened for me different, and I was able to use some of my, my experience because I pastored two churches in two different states. Right. I had already been into this, so I had my Live in Victoria show. Okay. I had the digital footprint. My church was okay. used to a screen coming down, and I wasn't <laughs> in town. And so they was used to hearing me preach via internet. Okay. So my churches didn't have such a major transition uh, because we were already somewhat doing it. I had to make uh, digital uh, adjustments right. and have to create some new things and new looks and new backdrops. But my church paradigms were right. there. Many churches that didn't have online giving, right? Uh, that didn't have financial structure set in place, right? That was all about emotionalism. Right. Pastors quit studying and were just getting up there and saying, Shaka Masha, hallelujah. Right. <laughs> they really didn't have nothing to say. When they got online, it showed. I mean, it showed. And so without financial structures, without having a strong team, churches are, they said 30% of churches may not return. And I know a lot of churches struggled and a lot of churches, you know, could not uh, keep up with the pandemic. And so for those pastors, it's really uh, quite interesting what I've done. I have fortified and undergirded those and even provided my teams okay. to come in to help them to, okay. to bridge the digital divide okay. free of charge. We've kind of helped so many churches really get themselves together and find new ways to present okay. an age old gospel. I like that. Right. And I just said something. We're going to find new ways <laughs> to present an age old gospel. That's what COVID did. Y'all quote me on that. COVID, COVID did that for the church. And then the second thing, now this is really important, Bishop Travis, and I don't know if anybody's going to ever say this but me. I also provided exit strategies for pastors that probably didn't need to pastor. And see, that was my question. I was going to ask you, should some be closing as a, as a result of the COVID pandemic? Now, I'm going to say something that's going to get me in trouble online. No, we're live. 
<laughs> there are people that should close and probably should have closed before COVID. <laughs> now, I, I don't know how we're going to receive this, but there are some people that should close because of COVID, but probably should have been closed before COVID. All right. I just said something. <laughs> about this, they know what they mean. I just said something. Um, and honestly, one of the things that I have dealt with uh, by pastoring pastors is everyone that started a church wasn't called. Mm. And COVID just really highlighted two things, those that were called and those that wasn't called. And uh, honestly, I've ran into pastors, Bishop Travis, that actually wanted an exit strategy, right. but they didn't know what to do. Right. And by me coming as bold as I've said it to you, I've said it to some. Right. And I went, they called me and I asked them what happened as, as I consulted with them and collaborated. Mm -hmm. I found out that I couldn't help them. If I gave them money, it wouldn't help them. If I if I if I gave them training, it wouldn't help them. And truthfully, some just kept on going because, you know, when you call the pastor, right. where do you go from there? Like, how do you exit the stage? Right. And so I've started in this season exiting, uh, starting an exit strategy, showing pastors how you still can be of use to the kingdom without being number one. Wow. Some That's of them a are conversation we're not having. Yes. Yes. I love that. Because yeah. that, that's it. You've you got the plane in the air, but don't know how to land it. There, there you go. There are some good number ones that are now number ones would be excellent number twos. Now, I'm going to go back. You you mentioned you give them training, teams, resources. How do you know when this is just the natural struggle, be patient, hang in there, God's going to eventually add to the church versus you know what? Nothing has happened. Nothing's going to happen. Let's stop wasting everybody's time and money. Let's let's go to something else. What what is it something you look for in making that decision? You know, this would be a deeper conversation. Maybe we can have it later. <laughs> uh, I have a different maybe paradigm for church. I believe that the church should not just build churches, but we need apostolic centers. And, and maybe later in another class, we can get into this. <laughs> But, but an apostolic center shortly is just a hub uh, that's located in the region that will provide training and resources for not just their church, but other churches. Okay. okay. And I, I will make this statement. There are a lot of people that's building uh, empires, but not the kingdom. So when I build an empire, mm -hmm. I'm building just for me. When mm -hmm. I build a kingdom, it goes into your, your anointing succession. I am now building something that's greater than me and just won't impact my church, but will impact churches outside of my church and not just competing with churches in my city, but I'm in my city to enhance everybody. They say Michael Jordan made everybody better. Right. So we need other pastors that will go into regions and really start apostolic centers. And that means a hub that's not just there to build your local congregation, right. but a hub that will provide resources to others. Now I say that to answer your question. So a pastor that's in that predicament needs two things. He needs to be really connected to God in prayer mm -hmm. and make sure that he understands uh, and feels what that burden and calling is. But then outside of his own discernment and call, he needs also a pastor. Every pastor needs a pastor. I don't know how to say that in any other. So you, every pastor, and you need to be really submitted to a pastor to give that pastor access mm -hmm. to say things to you that nobody else can say to you. Right. I don't know if that makes sense. Right. And so I can't say this to everybody, but I have certain pastors that I have relationships with mm -hmm. that I could actually sit down and say, hey, you've been doing this for 10, 15 years. Right. Your wife is tired. Mm -hmm. Your children are tired. Mm -hmm. Your dog might even be tired. The, the few people that's coming to the church is right. super tight. Right. And you are a, a great leader. Mm -hmm. You would be perfect in an apostolic center. You would be perfect right. in another church that right. needs your wisdom and guidance. But you sitting here at this stage, you're going to kill yourself early. You're going to wear your family out. Wow. And you're not really making an impact to the kingdom. Now, you can't say that to everybody because some right. pastors say, who are you? Right. I mean, who, who do you think you are? But to the person that's submitted to an apostolic father, right. they can receive that. And, and then one pastor told me, Bishop, you, he started crying. He said, you wouldn't recognize I just needed somebody to tell me. I knew that. Mm -hmm. But I need to come. And he says, well, what do I do? And I was able to say, OK, here's what we can do. I'm going to connect you here. I can help you transition from this point. Mm 
-hmm. We can also give you a position where you can now work and, and work in the kingdom with the time that you got left to leave a legacy for the kingdom of God. He told me all I wanted to do was work for God. I just didn't know how to leave the platform that I had put myself on because he was afraid of what the community would say right, and what the church would say. And so I think a pastor needs that connection with God, but every pastor needs a pastor that can speak into their life and make sure that they understand what to do. In the apostolic church, Pentecostal church, we have a problem with certain theology. Mm -hmm. We're the only ones that sometimes die in the pulpit. Like we, we right. feel like if we pass a baton, if we, if we retire, right. if we, if, if we become pastor emeritus or, right. oh my God, I've just backslid. When in right. truth, <laughs> when in truth, the kingdom would be so much better right. if we had pastors, and I want to say this, Bishop Travis, that will get over themselves there you go. And, and get to a place that we understand that the kingdom is bigger than one person. My God. My God. You you you're a preacher. Y'all need to like, share, comment, <laughs> tag somebody because Bishop is on fire uh tonight. And, and I was just thinking, we we give out the titles of the fivefold ministry, but we really don't believe them. Yes. We try to funnel everybody into pastoring when there's other roles and responsibilities and the kingdom needs, the church needs these other ministries. Yes. Wow. Absolutely. You know why we have so many churches? It's because we don't understand the fivefold ministry. And so what happens is, let's say you have five people in the church. Mm -hmm. You got somebody can teach. Right. Somebody can prophesy. Mm -hmm. you, you, got, you, got a, you got an evangelist. What ends up happening is, if the prophet is not used effectively, Mm -hmm. He's going to leave. Right. And uh, if your church is called Praise Covenant, now you got Praise Covenant Church of Prophecy. <laughs> then then if the teacher, you hooping as a pastor and you don't teach, right. people going to go to them and say, man, he right. ain't saying nothing. I need some word. Right. You ought to start a church. Now you got Praise Covenant Teaching Church. Then you got the evangelist over there that they shout every service on Sunday night. He gets up, the pastor let him preach and they shout. And right. the pastor can't get the shout. They say, boy, man, if you started the church, boy, I would come to your church. And right. he don't he doesn't understand and won't go to his leader to work out the fivefold ministry or the pastor is not using him. So now you have Praise Covenant Worship Center. You see what's going on. <laughs> and we're in the same city right. with five of the same churches and all of them are doing OK. But what would happen if all of those people were together right. and the fivefold ministry was operating in one church? We would see the spirit of God. And there's nothing wrong with them attempting the pastor. But what they don't know. That if you only have a teaching anointing, right? That's all that's gonna happen to your people. Right. They're gonna get tired of you as well because now they're gonna need the prophecy right. and they're gonna need the preaching, but you have only one call. But if we can get all of the fivefold gifts together, then the church would flow in a different dimension. But that's when I mentioned the structure, the order that we've got to bring the church back together mm -hmm. so that our church would flow. And pastors can't be competitive. Right. With the prophet, he can't compete with the right. teacher. Right. He's got to understand that's not your role and let them enhance who you are so that the people of God can get blessed. My God, I felt like preaching that. <laughs> I love it because <laughs> you hear these conversations of mergers. I just helped the church uh, facilitate a merger and they'll come together, realize their strengths and weaknesses. But then the question still is, who's in charge? Yes. Is that a cultural thing? Is that just a male ego thing? Why is that part in the end seemingly the biggest sticking point? I think it's a cultural thing and it may be a um, a, a, a racial cultural thing. It okay. may be a black thing. Okay. Because if you really go study some of our even non-apostolic Caucasian churches, mm -hmm. I was and I study a lot of mega churches. Uh, you never got it all. All bishops right. think that you got it all. You wrote right. a book and now that that seals that you got knowledge of, but you don't have it. Bishop Golder taught me that. You never reach that potential. I study a lot of people, not just apostolic, not just Pentecostal. I study everybody. I was at a church not long ago and I walked in and um, I was talking to the senior pastor. He called the lead pastor. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was. he said, I have a hundred pastors. Now, you know, when, when he said that, first thing happened in my head, I said, my God, we scared of an assistant pastor. In the it, we had to pray for eight months to, to choose our assistant pastor. And he has a hundred pastors and they're all getting along. And so I had a chance to meet with them. Right. 
And what I learned from that that meeting was everybody has a lane. There you go. And the lead pastor is not competitive with the preaching pastor. He's not competitive with the youth pastor. He's not competitive with the work. They all understand we need each other. And he said something to me, working together works. And if we as a cultural church, a Pentecostal apostolic denomination really wants to grow, Mm -hmm. We're going to have to build collaboration and alliances. We're going to have to bring the fivefold gifts together. And we got to stop being competitive with the people God called to our ministries. Wow. <laughs> I want to say this. Everybody don't have a demon that don't agree with you. <laughs> Pastors, everybody is not against your vision because they don't see things the way you see it. Right. You pray all night, God, send me good people. Right. God, send me senior leaders. God, help my church. And then he sends you somebody that says, maybe we could do it a different way. Right. And you boycott them <laughs> because now they are not in your clique. When we get to a place that we can receive from people oh that God. are under us, then God will be able to take us higher. See why I love this band? You are <laughs> dropping so much wisdom and knowledge. And I'm thinking about uh, not only on the local level, but you've tried to foster uh, apostolic unity on a, a national, global level, um, even with the fathers. And you even tried it with the common culture, with the, the next generation. What do you see as the biggest impediment to, I guess, global apostolic unity? Is it the same issues that we see on a local level? It just gets magnified on a, a national, international level. Uh, yes, I, I think you know, from a from a unity perspective, you know that there are two things that happens that prevent us from unity: is positions and competition. His positions, I, I you know, I just say things straight because I don't have a board to answer to, and I don't have to worry <laughs> about getting in trouble. I told you that's why I do what I do. So, uh, it's positions and competition. Now, it's hard to pull people together because in our denominations, I've done it before and I brought all these missions. The first thing everybody's staff asked me, mm -hmm. who gets the big chair? That was the first question. It was not about really what's the next steps. It was not about uh, what this could do to enhance the kingdom. It was about we're 10 organizations. Mm -hmm. All right. And the question was, who's getting the center chair? So this is what I told them. I said we would put everybody in the same kind of chair. And I said, technically, let's put everybody on the front row in the audience. And then their protocols couldn't handle that. You right. know, it was like, oh, no, because this is the oldest organization. This is the second oldest. This is the fourth oldest. How do we figure out who speaks first? And I told them, I said, that is what's hindering us. Who's going to get the glory? Whose organization is highlighted the most? And then secondly, it was competition. And the competition was who's going to get the most preaching time? And whose network would we put it on? Nobody asked questions about like the glory that would come from it. How could this impact the kingdom? How could we come together and do more together than we could do apart? And so when I got uh, through with a certain phase and I'm now retooling counterculture as we speak, I'm retooling. I was going through the fathers and I found out that the fathers were leaving us. Mm -hmm. And with the position and competition of the fathers, it may be very difficult to do. Right. And the Lord spoke to me and said, you got to go to the sons. Okay. You, you got to go to the next generation. And so when you came to Indianapolis, we wanted to do the first one there where it all started. Uh, and that was the first attempt to bring the sons together. And what a glory happens at that time. I mean, I think today about uh, we didn't even get to preach. We were all had people right. lined up. And I don't think half of us got to say nothing. No, nope. I think Todd Delaney sung a song. That's it. And we were all on our face. I got those pictures. We were just laying in the glory of God. That's and it. nobody got a chance to really preach. I was right. looking at youth leaders. And right. I didn't forget I was pointing at them because the glory was going. And they were next. And they would do like this. That's all right. That's, That's okay. It. I pointed to the next one. I said, you want to come? Mm-hmm. This flow in the glory, because when the when the glory comes and unity produces glory and when the glory right. comes, you don't need politics. You don't need a chair. None of us were sitting. We were all kneeling. We were all laying. We were all worshiping God. And so I think if we get more concerned about the glory than the position, then we would see the glory of God come in. And I think unity produces that. And, and Bishop, that's why Satan fights unity so much. Because right. he understands unity would produce so much more than we could produce out of our programming, out of our politics, 
uh, out of our competition. And so I believe, now I really believe, and that's one of my assignments is to continue to, to merge and bridge the body of Christ together. I believe that we will one day, if the Lord delay, see uh, the body of Christ be able to come together in more unified ways. What that looks like, nobody knows. Right. But I believe the attempt at that should be continued because I believe God will get much glory when we form that type of unity. Wow. And I thank God for you being a person that has been willing to invest in that, facilitate that, take the hits from it to try to pull people together. I know it's not easy. Right. You know? and, and what I found is interesting. Some of the, you know, doctrinal issues that wants to, we don't even really have those same issues anymore. Mm -hmm. So it's like, so what's the issue? Right. Right. <laughs> you know, we, the things that the, our fathers argued over, we're not even arguing over anymore. But, right. you know, can we ever come back together? And, and, and I'm, I'm, that's, that, that conference was, was such a tremendous blessing. And, and I've stayed in contact with so many of the youth uh, yeah. presidents. I've had them on, even on this show. Yeah. And so I'm internally indebted to you. Uh, for that opportunity just to be invited to, to be in the room. I didn't even want to get remote. I was just glad to, to, yeah. to be in the room, and I thank you for that. I want to shift real quick, and we, we're getting ready to wind down. You, you're not only an author, a presiding bishop, a pastor, and pastor in two churches, and not just two different cities, uh, uh, but two different, not just two different states. I said two different time zones. <laughs> right. in California, Kentucky, and you talked about being able to navigate and how you had some things in place. But people don't know that you're also an entrepreneur. Tell us how you uh, uh, got started as an entrepreneur. You've op you opened a restaurant during the pandemic. Right. Someone say the craziest thing in the world <laughs> when restaurants are shutting down, right. with a limited capacity, and you open up a restaurant and God's hand is, is on it. Tell us about that. Yeah, well, the entrepreneurship of me have started years ago. Uh, I have uh, been an avid um, investor and um, I owned uh, several different ventures. Um, uh, one of those have been the restaurant that you've mentioned uh, when I moved to California a few years ago. Um, I had owned restaurants uh, for, you know, probably five or 10 years. Uh, throughout my ministry, I've always had a restaurant in Louisville. I owned three or four restaurants. And then when I got to California, I said I was done with restaurants. I sold all my equipment. My wife and my family, we were done. And uh, we were walking around the waterfront, me and my wife, just kind of chilling one day. And uh, just seeing the yachts and the boats and, you know, just enjoying California. And lo and behold, I look across the street and a guy was putting up a lease sign mm. on, a, on, a, on a restaurant. And uh, right at the waterfront in a place where uh, you know, uh, most of us wouldn't own restaurants. And so me, you know, having that kind of uh, curiosity, I go over and talk to the guy. And I knew in California, if you know about real estate, it's so high right. to right. own anything on the waterfront would be millions of dollars. So I said, I'm going to talk to him. My wife is pulling my hand like, please don't go. Please, <laughs> please don't go. Because she knew what was going to happen. She said, please. I said, well, baby, come on. We just, we're not going to start. Now. We're just going to go talk to the guy. Mm -hmm. And I, I went and talked to him and uh, I've always had that favor. I can talk to people and, um, and I get favor. I don't know how that I thank God for that, but I do. So I talked to him and he said, I like you. And he asked me what I did. And uh, I never tell him I'm a pastor. Mm -hmm. I just say, hey, this is what I do. And I've you know, owned some restaurants in the past. And he said, I'll tell you what, I've got somebody lined up for the building. If they fall through, I'm going to call you. Mm -hmm. And um, it was about three, four days later he called me. And I said, well, what do you want? And he said, I'll tell you what. Because it's COVID, um, I don't think that I'm going to really get anybody for a year. Mm -hmm. So if you write up your own contract, tell me what you want to do, then I will consider. And so me, I went home. I didn't tell my wife. I went home <laughs> and I wrote up a whole contract and I told the guy what I wanted. Uh -huh. uh, I told him I didn't want to pay anything to after COVID. Uh -huh. And I just needed time to build out and start. And then we would reconsider after COVID. Uh -huh. Now, at that time, COVID was so bad. Right. They were willing to sign anything. Right. And basically he gave me what I wanted. And um, I started the restaurant and uh, didn't know what was going to happen. I mean, new to the area. Nobody knew me. Nobody knew my food. Uh, you know, and we're a black owned business on right. the waterfront with yachts. You know, what are you going to do? And I started the first day I opened up my restaurant, the very first day. And some of my workers are online. So I still making comments the very first day. We had people that were two blocks in a line for two blocks 
that came for two blocks to test my food. I knew I had to hit the first day for two little blocks. People I didn't know you were life. there. You had, you did this big advertising campaign? All marketing. I did a whole marketing campaign online. Okay. We okay. walked the streets. I mean, we had foot soldiers. I mean, I did a major marketing campaign. Okay. And they showed up. The newspaper showed up. The mayor showed up the first day. It was a bigger thing. And so the word of mouth wow. got it out. Wow. The favor of God began to manifest. And um, we never, for that first two or three months, and here's a good story about those who may be business owners. Um, I made my initial investment back in 30 days. Every, and you know, most people start a business. It will take sometimes a year or two before you would even right. think right. you could see profit. I saw profit in 30 days. I'm gonna show you how big this was. In 30 days, I had more than doubled what I put into the business. That's how much money we made in 30 days. It was the biggest investment I've ever made, but I got the biggest return that I ever made in 30 days. And since that time, I think last week, we're now interviewing five to six more employees. I've been hiring people from the time we started to now. We're just now kind of getting through COVID in California. We right. went into a new tier. So people are eating in the restaurants starting last right. week. People are now coming in. And so we're about ready to get into our busiest season. Right. And as I've stated before, Restaurants that have been open for 20, 30 years on the same strip have shut down. I think we've been in the paper two or three times in the last couple of months. And the, all the articles said he's thriving, not surviving, which is, is a glory to God to know that in the middle of the pandemic, God can give favor. I want to release that if you let me for 30 seconds. Go ahead. Sir. I want to just release some some favor upon somebody's life. If you if you're listening. I just need you to put in the comment section so I receive this favor. Thanks. I want to pray and just send some favor. There are some business owners. There are some, some pastors. There are some entrepreneurs. You haven't even started your business yet. I believe that a favor uh, that comes can be transferable. I believe that God can send the same anointing of grace and favor that he put upon my life uh, into your life. And, and I want you to know now that he's not a respecter of persons. And though you are in a bad season of COVID, COVID can't stop those that are anointed. COVID can't stop those that are blessed. COVID can't stop a pastor uh, who, who's God's had his hands upon. And, and I want to release you from lack. I want to release you from debt. I want to release you from not enough. I want to speak into your life that God is about to give you more than enough. God is going to give you enough that you're going to need, uh, not just for your business, but he's going to give you overflow where you're going to be able to invest in somebody else and the same investment that I'm giving to you and the same prayer that I'm praying over you. I want you, when God blesses you, I want you to give that same favor, that same grace uh, to somebody else. I want you to declare right now, I have more than I need. Thank you. I, I have more than I need. And I release that in the name of Jesus upon every person on this call that needs God's favor. And it could be in the air of business, but I'm speaking in the era of finance now. I want every vision to be financed, every idea, uh, every creative idea, every thought. Some of you have a business you haven't started. Tonight, God, just because you tagged into Bishop Travis's show, God is going to give you some favor to initiate the idea that you thought you had to wait till COVID was over. God told me to tell you, start it now. Do it now because the hand of God is going to accelerate you. He's going to move you quicker than you probably thought. What it would have took five years to do, you're going to do in five months. What it would take two years to do, I prophesy, some of you are going to get the return. In two weeks, God is going to accelerate you and he's going to perform favor and you're going to receive the manifestation that comes from the power of the Holy Spirit. Be it unto you according to your level of faith in Jesus' name. I'm sorry, Mr. Travis. I just no, felt no. I needed to release that right then. Thank you, no. Jesus. Thank you. I, I, if you saw me looking at I was typing my name. <laughs> I typed my business <laughs> because of some things that I've been wrestling with. And, and, and you just spoke faith that, that God can bless you in the midst of a pandemic. I've never heard of somebody saying, well, you write your own contract. Yes. And, and will this accept it in? And I'll pay you once I get past it. Right. <laughs> right. That's right. That's, right. That's, That's ridiculous, right. man. That's hilarious. 
Uh, and that and that's why I said that sometimes COVID was a curse to some, but COVID was a blessing. I don't believe that I could have done that if it wasn't for COVID. I believe because of COVID, uh, people that own property got scared because they wouldn't have had no income. So he said some income was was better than none. But then when he seen the favor, he came back and said, can we redo the contract? And I said, no, sir. I said, no, sir. We, <laughs> we're going we're gonna to continue with what God has done. And, uh, and so I literally got uh, months of free rent. I mean, I got months and months. And that's why I was able to see my profit come back quicker because I didn't have the overhead that I normally would have had wow. if I had started in a non-COVID season. So God got some blessings in the middle of COVID. He got some stuff that he's doing. And I just released that into somebody's life. You're going to thrive and not survive. You're, Thank you, Jesus. You're going to thrive and not survive in Jesus' name. I want to. I'm gonna ask my wife to put your contact information. Your your follow you on uh, social media. Yes. Website. Um, you also have a class coming up this month. Yes. About uh, establishing uh, multiple streams of income. Tell us a little bit more about the class, and we're going to put the flyer up. So so people, are, are you still accepting uh, registration? Yes. Yes. Okay. I have a few spots left. Uh, Bishop Travis has been amazing. I believe the first day that I put that flyer up, we had over 100 people registered like the first day. And my team told me today that I don't know how many spots are left, but we're going to put that information up. We want you to be able to go. What I felt led to do uh, was to really teach people on streams. I started with pastors because okay. most of our pastors are dependent upon tithes and offerings. They, right. you know, they don't understand in this season that, and especially post-COVID, giving has been lowered. Right. And it, it'll be a different normal uh, once we get through COVID. And I felt led because of God's blessings upon my life to share some of the principles that I use. Mm -hmm. uh, many people knew me as the bishop and the pastor, mm -hmm. but a lot of people didn't know that I retired at 21. Uh, I have not worked for another person since I'm 21. Uh, I have been a consummate entrepreneur. Uh, I invest. Uh, and I've been teaching not just secular, I mean, religiously, but I teach in right. a secular way. And uh, some things I don't share because, you know, some people think you're doing that to brag or, right, you know, right. to be something. But I just grind. I, I, I have a silent grind. I don't tell everybody what I'm doing. And uh, when I've seen pastors struggle, the Lord has given me certain principles. I never wrote on this stuff. I never right. I never even told people what I do privately. God told me it was my time to release wisdom. Mm -hmm. And so I basically came up with a master class. I did okay. it free of charge. Actually, I'm not charging for it. It's free of charge. And the Lord told me to deposit within the people. And so I created this. My team said, you got to charge. You know, mm -hmm. your team is good for you because they want you to monetize it. And yeah. I got that. That's what my team is for. They said, you need to charge. People were charging this. You right. can do this. I prayed on it. I considered it. I believe people would have paid for it, actually. Right. Right. Uh, but the Lord told me, don't charge. And he, I prayed. And he said, do it free. He said, I'll bless you. But this is not the one you're going to get paid. For. And so I basically made it free of charge. Um, we're going to talk about new streams of income. I'm going to tell, teach pastors how to create funds outside of the church structure. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to talk to entrepreneurs about how to get the grants, uh, how to find the streams of income, how to package your business to make it creative. Uh, similar to what I'm telling you now, how to thrive right. Right. and not survive, how to make money work for you when you sleep. Uh, you know, I did this uh, as an experiment uh, the last uh, year. I, I created a business for my son. Uh, everybody in my house has a business. I created a business for my daughter. They are teenagers. Okay. Uh, both of them went in. We created their business from scratch. My daughter's making so much money on her business, she won't show me the bottom line no more. Because <laughs> I was her investor, right? I'm teaching her about investing. Right. So I invested and got her logos made and all of her right. marketing. And I said, well, you don't have any money. So I'm going to invest and you're going to give me some percentages right. or from, you know, I'm teaching her business. She was all in until she started making her money. And now she forgot the contract. And she told me, because you're my daddy, I'm not supposed to share. So I haven't seen her paperwork in the last quarter, right? Uh, but just teaching even young people uh, how to start out. You know, we came up, and people don't know my story, but I came up in a very poor neighborhood. I came up not with a lot of money. Dad was a hard worker, worked multiple jobs. He was an old school pastor, working and pastoring, taking home money to pay church bills. You know how it was back then. And um, I made up my mind that I wouldn't live that way and my kids wouldn't live that way. Wow. And the Lord blessed me uh, to do it at 21. 
Um, so I believe that we should start young. And so I started with my kids. And so I've even invited young people to join the class because right. it'll be simplistic enough for even teenagers to get it, uh, as well as pastors. We have bishops and pastors from various organizations. Right. It was so many pastors that came through. I was amazed. And it let me know that there was a great need. And many pastors needed to, to have this training, entrepreneurs, creatives. And so we kind of have a wide variety of people. It's next Monday. Okay. Next Monday, and uh, the brochure and information is there. They can go to, to the website, and they can just go register. It's free of charge. I would encourage them to do it today or tomorrow because I believe that we will be uh, already sold out by the time we get there on next Monday because we have limited space online to do it. But they're all welcome to, to come. And if you're looking for new streams of income, you're looking for uh, new uh, methodologies, uh, and everybody can use another screen. That's all. I don't care how successful you are. You go. This is not for people that are not successful. These are for people that are even successful, but you need another screen. And that's what we're going to be teaching and hope that it'll be a blessing to everyone. Wow. 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 I, I, hearing what you've said today and how you taught and how you've been parted and poured and spoke favor and blessings, you need to sign up. For this class. If you're watching, sign yes. up. And, and she, my wife put the flyer up briefly, but if you go to their website, yes, uh, information is there. Very simple uh, to to sign up. As we get ready to close out this conversation, um, you've accomplished so much. Um, and and, and well, let me ask this question first. You are the fourth. I'm amazed yes. by that. Um, <laughs> you know the fact that you know first, second, okay, maybe a third. You're William L. Harris the fourth. Your son. Is William L. Harris the fifth? That means there has to be not only just sons born, but sons born that respect their fathers enough to name their kid after <laughs> their yeah. father. Yeah. So as the fourth, what did you get from your fathers that you hope to pass down to fifth and maybe even sixth William L. Harris? You know, the amazing thing is um, five of us are, four of us are still living. Four of us are still living. Wow. Thank you, Jesus. And so my grandfather turned 94 just a few days ago. Thank you, Jesus. So that's William Harris the second. Of course, my dad is the third. I'm the fourth and my son is the fifth. Um, you know, my family was a family built up on holiness okay. and integrity. And uh, I believe that uh, <laughs> if I pick two, it's so much I want to give my son from my mm -hmm. father's. But if I pick two things, it would be uh, a legacy of holiness and integrity. You know, my father, grandfather, my grandfather's a head deacon at my father's church. So it's a lot to say <laughs> in that to itself. And um, both of them were men of holiness. They okay. taught me as a young man holiness right. and, and holiness in a different way than we say holiness today. You know, <laughs> holiness uh, when we came up was not just the way you dress. It was the way you live. Right. And they right. didn't believe in uh, girls on the side and extras. Right. And, you know, we had to like if you're going to preach in that church, you're going to live it. Right. It was through a fact that that would come in, and when I was young, you know, we had motherboards then too, and the mother would pro would would discipline you as much as the bishop. And my grandma said, "Are you dark today?" They would say, "You're dark. You must be in sin, right?" And you you look your color different. I came up in that kind of holiness. Right? <laughs> uh, I came up in holiness where uh, when we grew up, we had to wear certain things, and we right. couldn't dress certain ways, and we couldn't go to certain places, and we couldn't uh, have a girlfriend, and. And uh, we couldn't go to the prom. I mean, we had it was a whole different world when I came up. I might be the last Mohegan of that <laughs> of that generation. Um, but I, I, I'm not even want to emphasize the dress as much as I want to emphasize the integrity right. and the, the holiness of how we walked. Mm -hmm. And so my father and grandfather have modeled uh, fatherhood to me, how to raise up children with the fear of God and how to love God. Mm -hmm. how to love your wives. My father's been married over 50 years. Mm -hmm. My grandfather was married over 60 years. I'm just showing you how the integrity and they've been saved, you know, for years. And I saw it uh, modeled in front of me. So my son uh, ends up being the fifth. Uh, and my son is a genius. You know, he's a, he's a genius, intelligent, new generation. Don't dress like I dress. Think I'm old fashioned. Uh, got his own style, got his own look. But one thing that I wanted to instill into his heart was integrity mm -hmm. uh, and never to forget that holiness is still right. Thank no you. matter what happens in this generation, no matter how far the church goes, no matter what uh, he's on college campus and he's studying and he's becoming who he wants to be. And I never told my kids that they had to be saved. But what I've done is I've tried to instill in them 
a, a sense of integrity, a sense of holiness. And if I could pass anything down, those two characteristics would be something that I would want my son to to remember, uh, not just to remember, but I would pray that he would model uh, the same traits that I was able to model from my parents. So when you made the statement a while back that the church has become too worldly, is that what you're referring to? Yes, I mean that's a that, that word worldly is so broad now. The church has become so we become so liberal in our attempt to be relevant. Mm -hmm. We we, we want to be so relevant, but in the attempt to be so relevant, we become so worldly. We become, you know, we want to like uh, we say we have to be uh, so relevant. That means that we have to get so close to the world to in order to win them. We've got to look like them. We got to act like them. We got to go where they go. And we put all those principles in the church and mm -hmm. we have our young people. Their idols are no longer. When I came up, my idols was going to be Bishop Noel Jones. Right. It was going to be Bishop Norman Wagner. Now, our this generation's idols are Beyonce and right. Jay-Z. And then parents are wondering why. It's because the church has got so close to the world because of this word modeling. Mm -hmm. uh, and we want to get there and we got to be relevant that right. we forgot. Uh, that we can change our methodology, but our me message got to stay pure. And we still got to teach people that your character matters. Mm -hmm. What you listen to matters. Right. Or where you go, you can still be relevant. You can right. be progressive. I'm a progressive. Right. But you still got to, uh, sometimes you got to pull it in. Right. And we got to let our young people know you can't listen to everything and still stay in worship. You can't, you can't go everywhere and, and still stay pure. You can't hang with everybody. Right. And still stay sanctified. You can't just do what the world does and expect that when you try to tap into the spirit, it's always going to come. And so I see so many uh, young people being misled. Mm -hmm. I, and, and, and people that speak to this, we old fashioned, you know, uh, when you <laughs> preach like this. Well, right. he's out of date. I'm more in date than most of these pastors that saying they in date. Right. They look like they got it. Right. But because you got skinny jeans on, uh, <laughs> that doesn't mean that you're relevant to the world. It may just mean you are modeling their culture. Right. But the church was never supposed to get along with the culture. We were supposed to be a counterculture. Thank you, we Jesus. were never supposed to uh, be like the world. Mm -hmm. We were supposed to be the salt and influence the world. But it looks like the world is influencing us more wow. than we are influencing the world. So when I made that statement, it really meant that we're becoming way too worldly. And I know many of our senior leaders right. uh, maybe feel like they can't say what I'm saying. Again, I'm mobile enough to say these things. But I really believe that uh, from the head on down, we need to pull it in. And right. and I know it's not a popular sermon. You're right. not going to be called to preach with this kind of message. Right. But I would say that the church world needs to hear holiness. Thanks. And we need to go back to really teaching people that holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And Bishop didn't quote that. That's in the word of God. Go. And I just want to highlight holiness. Is, somebody put that in the, in the script. Holiness <laughs> is still right. Holy, I know somebody agreed with the Bishop. Holiness <laughs> is still right. Wow. Amen. Thank you so much, Bishop Harris. I, I could keep talking to you. I don't want to hold on to you. <laughs> you have been a blessing to me in my life. Good. And even we don't talk all the time, but just... Right. Just following on social media, what you're doing and, and, and how God is blessing you, your leadership impartation. And now with a lot of your conferences, bringing virtual, I'm able to kind of sneak in on them and, yes. and catch some of the things that, that you're saying. I'm going to, uh, my wife is going to put your cash app on the screen. Uh, so if anyone that heard something today, that was a blessing, uh, even the prayer that, that he prayed, I believe in someone where you want to grow, so yes. where you want to go. And uh, Bishop Harris is good ground. I'll be someone personally put his cash out there. Uh, my last question, and then I'm going to let you just give close remarks. You've done so much author, entrepreneur, your husband, your father, your pastor, your presiding bishop. On your epitaph, what three words or phrases would you want written? What do you want to be remembered for the most? I, I, I thought about this and um, I, I think I would probably use two words and, and that's just a pioneer and a builder. Mm. Um, I, I really feel when people ask me sometimes like, what is your chief assignment? Mm -hmm. I think the chief assignment for me is a builder. Uh, I'm able to 
bridge gaps for people. And I've, I've got an, an uncanny ability to bring people together. And you said that with counterculture and what we've been able to do through ICAF and my passion even globally. I, I travel around. And a lot of people say they travel around the world, but I literally yes, you do. <laughs> travel around the world. I go places nobody else goes. I'm actually planning a church as we speak in Pakistan, like literally. And I uh, was supposed to go there right before COVID. And right. uh, literally I bring people together even in global communities that normally would not even come together. And so I believe that the Lord has graced me to be a builder. And I believe that I've just turned 50. I believe my greatest work is in front of me and not behind me. And I say this with all humility. I believe everything I've learned so far was to get me ready for my season. I, I don't believe you've seen the greatest of Bishop Harris. I believe I've stayed in the background. I'm not politics. I don't try to get on people's stages. I don't push myself. I just grind. I do what God called me to do. The Lord spoke to me last year and he said, I'm getting you ready for something bigger than you. And so I really believe and I'm challenging my team to prepare that I believe that my greatest work and I believe I've been called to my generation and those coming. Bishop Noel Jones called me on my 50th and prophesied to me. And he also sent the video and he said, Bishop Harris, I was able to do some things, but I can't bring the generation that you've been called to together. Mm. And he believes I can. I believe there's an anointing upon my life that's going to cause me to be able to do that. And so builder and a pioneer. I've always tried to do things. And I don't, a pioneer doesn't follow the path of other people. Thank you, Jesus. A pioneer cuts their own path. And uh, the Lord has allowed me, and I don't believe it's my grace because I don't feel like I'm qualified to do what I'm doing. I believe God has called me to pioneer some things. And so uh, if you would ask me that, I would say a pioneer and a builder. I don't really want anything else. I, I don't want the accolades to be about how big my churches were, right. how I traveled, and what I built, and my entrepreneurship. Right. I think I would be satisfied if people remembered me as just a pioneer and a builder. Then I will let my work speak for me on everything else. I, I think that, again, those are my my two main things that I really want to be reminded or remembered for. I love that. To your sons, holiness and integrity to the world at large, pioneer and builder. Yes. Bishop William Harris, thank you so much you. For, for your impartation, your wisdom, your example, your role model. I don't know if there's anything that is in your spirit you feel like you need to say before you log off. The mic is yours. Gotcha. No, I want to thank you first for uh, inviting me to be a part um, of, of the discussion. Um, I believe that a lot that God is going to do in this season will start with simple dialogue. And uh, so I think what you're doing uh, and uh, even writing your book about secession is so important for uh, the church and mantles. And, um, you know, where will the mantle fall? Um, you know, a lot of questions. Who's got next? Uh, who is it God's going to use in our generation, in our season? I've seen in COVID so many of our fathers dying. Mm -hmm. I got news yesterday, even in the Church of God in Christ, another great uh, general board member passed away. And uh, uh, even in our churches, the, we've seen people leaving us. And I look around at my generation. I look around at our pastors that are our ages. And I think about what will we do? Well, who will carry the mantle? Who will stand up? maybe not be popular, right. but we'll make sure that uh, our generation and the generation after us and our children's generation, mm -hmm. if the Lord would delay, would have a foundation. I believe, uh, Bishop Travis, that we're one generation away from apostasy. We're one generation away from apostasy. And I believe that if we don't uh, share the mm -hmm. teachings, the word right. of God and holiness with the generations coming after us, I think it's good to train them on how to be savvy on Instagram and Snapchat. Right. And those teachings are very important for me. Right. But there's somebody's got to pick up the mantle of doctrine. Somebody's got to pick up the mantle of, 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 of what apostolic means, what Pentecostalism means. Somebody's got to teach on character and integrity and, and holiness, because I believe that is the bedrock. That is the foundation of, of how we made it here. That's the foundation of how our fathers made it. And I don't want us to get so tech savvy that we forget uh, the foundation of how we came here. And so my prayer is that uh, our generation, a younger generation, uh, pastors, men, women, would pick up the mantle. Uh, and it may not be the people that mm -hmm. got a big bishop's name or their bishop's son, or mm -hmm. they got all of this legacy. And the people I believe God's going to use, you don't know yet. Thank I you. believe that the people God's going to use are being groomed on the backside of the mountain. 
I, I believe that uh, the people God's about to use may not be on a brochure today. They're not being invited to the national conventions. They're not being invited to all of the different conferences. Uh, I believe God's got uh, some rams in the bush. God's got some people that he groomed, he's preparing, and they're not even being prepared uh, through the ceremonialism of organizations and through the elevation of, of bishops, but they're being elevated in the spirit. And I believe that the people that are online tonight, you know if God's going to use you. Mm -hmm. The person that's got next is right. the person that's going through the most attack. The, the person that got next is the pastor that's trying to do it the right way, but being tempted to do it the way other men and women are doing. But their integrity, their holiness stops them from making a bad deal or selling out their soul or selling out their church just to get a crowd or to, to get on a big stage. And there are, there's a group of people, I call it a remnant. That's a group within a group. God's getting ready. I prophesy God's got a group that's going to grab the mantle. God's got a person. Thank you, Jesus. God's got persons. God's got individuals of every race, every creed, every color, position around the world that's going to grab the mantle. And I, I, I feel like God has always got somebody that's going to continue wherever the fathers leave off, wherever you may leave off, wherever I leave off. We've got a group of mantle carriers mm -hmm. that are going to come to the forefront. And I believe they're going to make God proud first. Secondly, they're going to make their fathers proud. Mm. And thirdly, uh, our generation is going to embrace that anointing in their life. And we're going to see God bring, watch this, a post-COVID revival uh, to, the, to the kingdom of God. I believe many people are going to be saved and healed and delivered. And many leaders are going to come up. And I prophesy that some of the people that you're going to see, they're going to come up and do what it took other folks 50 years to do. They'll be doing stuff in four years, five months. You're going to see major churches come up. You're going to see major reformations begin to grow. And what used to be uh, the, the, the rim of possibility uh, is not going to be the rim of possibility because greater works we're going to do. And uh, I believe God's going to do it. I believe God's already started. And so those of you that feel that urge in your spirit, sometimes you feel discontent, you feel irritated, you feel frustrated, you know it's more in you than what you're giving. You feel like you're bigger than the box you're in and you feel like you're bigger than even the organization. God says he's preparing you for greater. You've got to be patient. You've got to wait on God. And when the mantle falls, you'll be in position to receive it. You'll be in position to execute it. You'll be in position to do greater works. Remember, Elisha done double what Elijah did. Same mantle, but double portion miracles. I prayed and I've been around with some great men of God. I asked God not to be selfish, but, but I asked God, I said, Lord, allow me to do double. My desire is not just to follow in their footpaths, but let me build upon what they've already uh, laid. Let's build upon that foundation uh, and, and let's let their ceiling be our starting point. Lord Jesus. Let's let their ceiling be where we start. And real sons, uh, we don't try to outdo our fathers. We try to build upon where they left us. Real sons are not trying to, to diminish the reputation of our fathers or try to, to tarnish their reputations. Real sons and daughters want to build upon. I tell my sons, my ceiling is your start. Wherever God takes me, my ceiling is where you're going to start. And I really release that into the atmosphere and to your audience and to those that are on tonight to support me. I really believe that if we stay humble, we walk in integrity, we walk in holiness, stay in position, stay in alignment. And I want to say one other thing because it just dropped in my spirit. Watch the circles you hang around. Uh, you know, sometimes you're going to have to have a you're going to have to get a downgrade for upgrade. You're going to have to clean your circle out. Uh -huh. Make sure that you've got people around you that believe in. They're not just celebrating you or they're not just tolerating you, but they're celebrating you. You need people in your circle that don't just tolerate you, but they celebrate you. They see the God in you and they're willing to push you into new dimensions, even if they can't go with you. When you find that circle, when you find those kind of people that will actually tell you you're wrong and tell you when you're out of order and tell you when you're out of alignment, you found a great grace. And I want you to embrace the grace. Don't just get people that will tell you what you want to hear. Get some people that will speak into your life that will help you stay in position because in the end, you've got to be in position when the mantle falls. And uh, I really release in the atmosphere that God is getting us in position to receive the mantles of our fathers and the mantles that uh, Christ is going to send. And uh, I want to commend you for the work you're doing. I pray that 
uh, even the conversations that you're going to have for the rest of the month would just uh, build upon what we've talked about and that much grace be to you and your wife and your family as you go forth to do the work uh, of the kingdom. And uh, I pray that even the businesses and uh, your law firm and the work that you are attempting to do, uh, great grace be upon you and uh, great grace be upon your organization and church. And uh, grab those mantles, Bishop Travis. I mean, grab those mantles. God has positioned you strategically uh, in your organization, in your city, in your area. I don't believe it's by coincidence that we've connected. Uh, I don't believe it's by coincidence that your bishop saw in you something to uh, speak into your life and to elevate you. And so uh, we are a generation that uh, is just work, wanting to work for God and waiting for God to reveal even the greater. And so many blessings, much grace be upon your life. And all of you that are online that joined us tonight, uh, I want to pray. I'm just going to give a quick prayer, but I want to pray over you and thank you for your time. And I pray that our our dialogue tonight and conversation was a blessing. If it was, please leave Bishop Travis a comment as well. Let him know that this uh, show, this uh, dialogue is being a blessing. Sometimes we program and plan things and sometimes we even worry about if this is of God, and should we continue? And I believe that if you encourage him, uh, it will it will even be a blessing to let him know that his work is is not in vain. Let me pray, Bishop Travis, if I may. Father, for every person that's uh, online tonight, uh, that has listened tonight. We speak great grace upon their life. Uh, we speak great favor, great acceleration upon their churches, upon their businesses, upon their ideas, upon their ministries. I rebuke the hand of Satan. Everything that Satan has attempted to do to try to stop or delay them, we speak that there will be no more delays. We speak no more delays, no more distractions. In the name of the Lord Jesus, I break every tie, I loose every chain. Every assignment Satan has sent to stop, to delay them is being rebuked right now in the name of the Lord Jesus. They're being freed now in the name of Jesus to accelerate. I speak acceleration. Father, we, ex we ask you to accelerate their vision, their idea, their ministry, their church right now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. For those that are in position, those that you're working on and working towards mantles and receiving from their fathers and receiving from those great men and women of the faith, I ask you, God, now to keep them humble, walk in integrity, to keep them walking in humility, that they would be the sons and daughters that you've called for them to be. We pray great blessings upon Bishop Travis and his church and his family and the work that he's doing tonight. Have your way continually in all of our lives in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. God bless you. Uh, God keep you uh, is my prayer. Wow. Bishop, as you got me in tears. Uh, my, my God, thank you. You're thank welcome. You. Thank you. Thank you so much. To my guests, once again, thank you for being on tonight for Mantle Mondays. Uh, we, we do want to hear from you. If these interviews, these conversations are a blessing to you, uh, send us an inbox, email us, call us, text us, let us know. Uh, keep doing what you're doing. I'm enjoying it. I'm being blessed uh, by it. Thank God for the conversation tonight, the impartation. And, and he said, great glory. I just read today. Um, in Psalms, I'll give you grace and glory and the desires of your heart. And so I, I, I'm receiving that word uh, tonight. Uh, we, we want you to set your schedule uh, for next week. We have the former presiding bishop of Pentecostal Assemblies of the World, Bishop Charles H. Ellis III, uh, who will be with us um, on May 24th. My presiding bishop, Bishop Alfonso D. Brooks, uh, will be with us. And then we close out the month of May with uh, Bishop uh, C. Sean Tyson, uh, who's the pastor of Christ Church Apostolic in Indianapolis and the Mount Calvary Pentecostal Church in Youngstown, Ohio. Uh, thank God for my wife, who is the producer of these shows. And thank God for you that have tuned in tonight. And just remember that it's never too early uh, to prepare for success. God bless you and good night. Looking to start a church, business, or nonprofit organization in 2021? Do you need help forming an LLC, applying for a copyright or trademark, revising church bylaws, crafting a succession plan, or developing a compensation package for your pastor and staff? Contact the law office of Travel Travis, a Richmond based legal boutique focused on the needs of pastors, entrepreneurs, creatives, and our community. Let's make your vision a reality in 2021. Visit TravelTravis.com. That's T R A B E L L Travis. Travis.com.
If you're concerned about the future of your organization when you step down, then where will the mantle fall? A biblical and legal guide to succession planning is a must read for you. It delves into the scriptural and legal aspect of succession planning, characteristics of successors, the people, the process, church bylaws, common myths, even issues with nepotism. Where will the mantle fall? Written by Rich Mazzone attorney, Pastor Travel Travis, and available at Amazon.com.